Hey everyone, Happy New Year, and we want to say Happy New Year and welcome to the very first Radiotopia Presents of 2024. It's a series that we are truly excited about. It's called Shocking, Heartbreaking, Transformative. Now this is from documentarian Jess Shane, who put out an open call on Craigslist and then worked with four strangers to explore the standard rules that documentarians and journalists use to tell their subject stories. So the series gets into all sorts of questions about what happens when people's real lives are collected, edited, and consumed. The show pulls back the curtain on what goes on behind the scenes of your favorite nonfiction shows. And then it turns in on itself and some really interesting twists and turns along the way in the making of the show. I've gotten to know Jess a little bit over the making of this show. Every time I chat with her, there's a new wrinkle to this story. It is really incredible. So go check out the new Radiotopia Presents series, Shocking, Heartbreaking, Transformative. It is out now on your favorite podcast platform. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, April 24th, 1800, President John Adams approved the appropriation of $5,000 for the purchase of, quote, such books as may be necessary for the use of Congress. What did they decide to call this building that would house a collection of books that could be used by Congress? They called it the Library of Congress. The naming conventions were pretty straightforward back in the day, I guess. Among the early rules of the library were pretty strict borrowing guidelines. No map shall be taken from the library by any person nor book except by the president and vice president of the United States and members of the Senate and House of Representatives. So that is one of the perks of elected office was full library privileges, at least (laughs) back then. Here to discuss the founding of the Library of Congress and, of course, the way it has evolved over the years from a small collection of books to an institution of public and civic record are, as always, Nicole Hammer of Columbia and Kelly Carter Jackson of Wellesley. Hello there. Hello, Jody. Hey there. And our special guest for this episode, Carrie Greenwich of Tufts University, co-director of the African American Trail Project at Tufts, and among many other things, the author of the fantastic book, Black Radical, The Life and Times of William Monroe Trotter. Carrie, thank you for doing this. This is fun. Hey. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited. Hello, Kelly. And hello, everybody. <laughs> um, and so... Very quickly, this will turn into a story of fire and uh, and how when you put a bunch of books in a room, they catch on fire. But Nikki, uh, especially back then, uh, Nikki, let's start with this founding. We have five thousand dollars to have a small collection of books. Um, what is the kind of goal um, in 1800 of building this library? Well, so the idea is that you want the people who are making the laws of the country to have access to things like legal texts and books of political philosophy so that they're able to access all this information. Books are expensive in the late 18th century. Not everyone has access to a huge cache of all of the latest literature, all of the latest writings that might be useful for someone who's trying to create and run a government. And so the idea behind the Library of Congress is is we'll put all of these books together so that lawmakers, regardless of what their resources are, are going to be able to have access to this common store of knowledge in order to help make them better statesmen. Mm -hmm. I also think that when we think about nation building in this time, all great countries, empires have their libraries, have their their monument to uh, intellectual life and culture. And so the library really hmm. symbolizes so much of the heart, the intellectual heart of, of, a, of a country. Yeah, I think that's really important. The idea that this also symbolizes what you imagine the uh, intellectual and cultural foundation of the country to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that seems to be a tension that goes throughout, you know, I mean, there's the practical, or not, maybe not tension, but, you know, there's the practical use of going in and having a resource, and then there's, what does it mean for something to be in or not in the Library of Congress? Um, Carrie, what are your thoughts on these early days? And maybe you can be the one to uh, start talking about all the fires. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think just, just what uh, Kelly and Nicole were saying, I think it's this notion that um, the country had of itself in the late you know, 18th century, which was to be a republic was to have an educated populace, mm-hmm. right? That was kind of a big um, 
um, tenet of early little r republicanism. And so the notion that you would have a library, that you would have access uh, to states people, but statesmen at the time um, being learned, you know, crafters of law and politics was really, really important. And so it, it speaks to what you were just saying about um, the ambitions of the Republic um, in terms of what it saw for itself. But there is a private element here. I mean, so first off, a lot of these books were came from private mm-hmm. collections, right? So yep. uh, they would they would be donated or bought from private collections. And yes, this, I think, is more accessible, but it's not ex- it's not there's a version of this in which something that is truly civic minded and public and say something for the people. That's not exactly what this nobody's was, right? going in with the library card. No, right. <laughs> no, one's... right. It's, it's built for it. It's built for the elites, right? Exactly. It's like you would not go in there and see like somebody sitting sleeping in the, in the corner or something, or something like that. It really was for the elites, but it's also, you know, this, it, it kind of gives an idea of, you know, shows how important the development of the idea of a public library was later, like decades later, when cities started to say we need a public place for people to be. But, you know, the the original impetus behind it was that, you know, this is a place you go to as a statesman and learned Republican, again, little r, and you're going to um, read and sort of uh, uh, hone your skills as a thinker and as a politician. So I'm going to jump in and talk about the fires, because this is the thing that... um, (laughs) Just it, it, it kills me every time I read about it. So the British invade um, during the War of 1812. Everyone talks about burning down the White House. OK, we get it. That That's traumatic. But they also burned down the Library of Congress. Yeah. And so all of those books that had been collected there as this resource for the nation, mm-hmm. they they burn. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's pretty traumatic. Um, Although they do get replaced and they get replaced um, thanks to Thomas Jefferson, who doesn't exactly loan his books. He sells them for a a pretty penny to uh, the U.S. government to restock the Library of Congress. Can we just talk about how much Congress paid for his books? (laughs) Because, (laughs) yes, I know. I I know. Wow, man. (laughs) Jefferson is no joke. So Jefferson uh, (laughs) hears about the fire and says, hey, listen, I've got a great library. I'll share and uh, or I will sell you what I have. He brags about having, you know, 18 to 20 uh, wagons filled of books. It's a little less than that. It's about 10 wagons filled with books. Um, And he donates (laughs) 6,487 volumes of literature and basically sells it to Congress for $23,950, which is a lot of money. (laughs) It's a lot of money. Especially in the early 19th century. (laughs) So I'm I'm trying to do the math in real time here. So that's about $3 and 60 cents per book. Now, I don't know what that is in uh, 1815 money, but that seems yeah. like, you know, a decent decent chunk of change. But it's the- a ton of money. I'm, I'm, I'm just... I'm just thinking it now. Like, could you imagine now if somebody like everything burned and somebody came out of nowhere, like an ex statesman, and said, "Here, I'm going to sell you my books for the library." Like, we would, we would be, it would be so, yeah. <laughs> so controversial. It'd be like millions of dollars to get. I don't know, Bill Gates's books. Yeah, yeah. in there to replace. It would it'd just be, you know, it's, it's a funny. And there was there was controversy in this moment. Actually, I'm curious yeah. your reaction to this because you know the Federalists at the time complained or opposed this purchase because they said that there were too many books in foreign languages. Some of them, quote, too philosophical a character (laughs) for them to be in there. So, you know, I think you start to see a real this is a contentious space. If this is a place that is going to sort of help define the the country, what's in it um, really seems to be something people cared Mm -hmm. about. Yeah. Content matters. What what kinds of books is the library going to house what types of books I think matter. And even though Thomas Jefferson can give this wealth of, of literature, it's the kind of literature that people are so at odds with. But I think it also, you know, compels the library to expand and say, okay, let's let's just collect everything. Let's we just need we just need volume. <laughs> um we should say as well um that in 1851 <laughs> Guess what happens? Another fire takes out most of Thomas Jefferson's collection that he donated. So I I think the big lesson of this episode is going to be fireproof your libraries. (laughs) Or make your books out of something other than paper. There you go. It's time to go back to the stone and chisel. There you go. By the way, by the way, I, I, I knew that. $3.60 in 1815 was worth a lot, but I didn't, it is 60 
two dollars in today's oh, money. Wow. So they paid on average sixty two dollars per book from wow. Thomas Jefferson's collection. That wow. is, and that gives so you an idea joke. of how much they were actually paying him in turn in sort of like dollars today, right? Yeah. So if they Correct. paid him um, something on the order of twenty five thousand dollars, that's actually like five hundred thousand dollars in oh, today's yeah. money. Yeah. 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 For sure. Anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to derail the fire yeah. talk. I know. <laughs> But back to the fires. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Fireproofing, you know, fireproofing becomes also another thing that has to happen with a lot of these buildings. It happens in the Capitol, but it also, the design has to take into account when they build out the Library of Congress even more uh, for fires because books are highly flammable. And so, um, the, and these things, you know, have a tendency to happen over and over again. And it's hard to recover. I mean, some of these books that are incredibly rare, you know, you cannot replace them. These first editions cannot be yeah. replaced. Um, so it's not as though they have, you know, copies upon copies of the same book book um mm-hmm. and and even if they did if all those copies are destroyed it doesn't make um doesn't make for a great library so yeah this definitely yeah. becomes an issue and we will we will get to that in a little bit i mean that the library of congress still is kind of the library of last resort for a lot of stuff mm-hmm. like when a regular library can't find something it's often the library of congress that where they will find it but carrie what is your sense of when it does start to turn from a collection of works uh to something more symbolic that tries to uh you know encompass a national spirit so after during the civil war abraham lincoln appoints ainsworth van spofford who becomes the librarian of congress and in that spirit of the civil war of lincoln's administration um sort of rebuilding and reframing the possibilities of the federal government and what it would mean kind of in, in the lives of the states and the people. Um, Spofford was the one who really um, changed the way the library interacted with the public. Um, he centralized its registration and he made it um, a place where copyright activities were brought through a copyright law. He didn't invent, invent the law, but in 1870 it's passed and it basically meant that um, paintings, drawings, statues, as well as books that would be deposited, one would be deposited in the library and then one would be deposited in, in the public. And so what this did was it changed what types of books were put in there. So you still had people d- donating private collections, but you also had uh, somebody would print a book, say, in Boston, and they'd have a copy, say, in Boston, and then they would, if they did co- copyright, it would then be in the library of Congress. So it really opened it up for the things that everyday people were reading. And of course, this is the the period of like popular literature and, you know, Mark Twain and all these people coming out. You could have popular literature, you could have law books, you could have, um, you know, uh, statues, you could have paintings, you could have all these productions of American culture, right? That were then put into this and copyrighted and then a copy of them was put into the library. So that was really, really where it started to change um, during, during the 1870s. Yeah. Yeah, there's a real kind of democratization of mm-hmm. what you have in the Library of Congress that that maps onto, um, as Carrie was saying, the the changes in Americans' readings habits, but also. You know, by the late 19th century, you start to have cheap print available and cheap paper mm-hmm. available. And all of a sudden, you don't have to pay $62 in today's money <laughs> in order to buy a book um, and donate it to the or give it to the Library of Congress. Um, that it, Those mass market paperbacks and other types of books mm-hmm. means that the collection expands so rapidly. And because of that copyright provision, it becomes a real snapshot of what Americans are creating in that period, as long as they're creating it under copyright, which is a good caveat to the exactly. limit of that yeah. collection. That's a very good yeah. point. I will say because yeah. of that, the Library of Congress becomes the largest library in America. So, mm-hmm. you know, I think Harvard likes to brag that they're second only to the Library of Congress. But like this idea that Every single thing that gets published that is of note and, you know, maybe of ill repute, all of it is going to have a a home, a space, be cataloged um, within the Library of Congress. But I also think that in the 20th century, you know, for scholars, for academics um, like many of us, you know, the Library of Congress becomes a major hub that you can travel to, that you can have access to every single book that you might not be able to travel as easily to Montana or California or for a certain map. But you can get this map in the Library of Congress. You can have access to it Mm -hmm. in ways you wouldn't um, had, you know, previously. And I was just going to say, off of what Kelly was saying, you have access as a scholar now contemporarily with all the books that are in there, but you also have access to like the way the books look. I mean, if if you're somebody who's interested in like just book culture and that aspect of history and culture and literature, 
going in and seeing, for instance, how, you know, books look or felt or the way that they were actually made the physicality of it is is sort of a way that mm-hmm. scholars often do some of their best work is, is looking at the book and the text itself but also mm-hmm. looking at well what did it mean the way this text was produced so it is still the case that only members of congress and the president and the vice president are allowed to actually check books out mm-hmm. but as we are all saying you can go there and do research and I, I i mean i think you're saying it but i was curious as we start to wrap up have, have all of you been to the library of congress and yeah. done research oh, in, yeah. In, in, in your... oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 it's the best. So talk, talk about it. <laughs> There's actually kind of a, a hierarchy, right? So yes. um, you have yeah. the Jefferson Building, which is this beautiful building. Yeah. Um, and then you have the other ones that are more... We say um, <laughs> utilitarian, um, and yes. so there's there's all these kinds of different spaces. And so for me, there's a manuscript reading room that's really beautiful mm-hmm. yeah. in one of the more utilitarian buildings. Um, but I was there once working in microfilm, mm-hmm. and it was shoved up into this little alcove um, in this very 1970s cubicle like um, office <laughs> space, and there was. In, in sort of the most stereotypical government bureaucrat way possible, um, this guy who would fall asleep right after lunch every single day and just <laughs> snore. And that is probably my clearest memory of being in that space. I love the. I have I have another yeah, funny. Go ahead. Yes, another funny story. In that place I was in there doing reading, and of course I'm talking about you know the books and the way they looked, and I was on a micro micro film, but they had like the photograph of what the book looked like so it wasn't the actual book so I was like oh my gosh look how you could see like the the plate the way the plate was laid out and everything and this woman next to me was doing some type of research and she just started laughing like she was like ah, 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 some type of researcher and it turned out she had been looking for this book like a microfilm just photograph of it of what it looked like and she finally found it so that's like always my memory of what that mm-hmm. utilitarian building and it's like all these characters in academia being there in their little hovels and then suddenly someone like laughs or they're sleeping or they're like <laughs> it's, it's an aha pretty, pretty moment amazing. it's an aha <laughs> that's moment right. exactly it's only in the library of congress when you're in their reading rooms or wherever where you have access to these obscure materials and you find mm-hmm. your needle in a haystack you know so it's great. it's so yeah. gratifying and even i'll say maybe Maybe, maybe a third or the fourth of the pictures I used in my book, uh, I got permission yeah. from the Library of Congress to use. So it's not just books, yeah. it's images and prints um, that you can yeah. have access to. That's a really big deal. I'm curious if you have thoughts on just kind of, you know, what it means for something to be included and not included in the Library mm-hmm. of Congress. I mean, you know, they are consistently... Uh, taking on new collections and making decisions. I mean, I mean, the world of podcasting was recently sort of shook up because they decided to take on a number of podcasts and they made some very interesting choices about which ones would be kind of in the official collection. Um, And Nikki, I mean, you, you know, you're sort of working a little bit on a sort of historical project right now with the Obama project. I'm just curious kind of how you think about these choices of what's in and what's out and what it, what it means. Well, I mean, basically the creation of an archive and, and that's what we're doing with the Obama project is a political act. Right. In deciding what comes in and what goes out, you're you're making an argument really about what's important, what really matters. And it becomes, I think, even more challenging for something like the Library of Congress in this era, because there is so much stuff being created every single moment. And it is storable because so much of it is digital. Like, are you going to record every tweet in existence? Are you going to store um, every music video, every song, every podcast, how are you, and if you're not going to do that, how are you going to make the choices about what's in and what's out? And so you also get, uh, in addition to kind of a snapshot of what's being created, you get a snapshot of the politics of an era based on Mm. what's being brought into Mm -hmm. the archive and what's Mm -hmm. being left out. Mm. Yeah, I would not want to work at the Library of Congress now. (laughs) I would not not want to be in charge of like, you know, the tweet division. I would not want (laughs) Oh God! <laughs> um, so as we wrap up, do any of you know what the smallest book in the Library of Congress is? The smallest book. <laughs> it is Old King Cole. That is apparently one twenty fifth of an inch by one twenty fifth of an inch. <laughs> it's about the size of a period at the end Ooh. of a sentence. Uh, and uh, oh, that's book. not a book. <laughs> okay, there. Oh, whoa, there's a whole other. Oh, okay. right. yeah. uh, and, and the. The largest book is five feet by seven feet, and it features colored images and that's of Bhutan, Bhutan, right? Yeah, wow. How did you know that? Bhutan, yes. 
How did you know that? Oh my, I'm a, I'm my, how did I know that? Oh, I, my, my mother, when she found out I was doing this was like, and make sure they know that the biggest book was from Bhutan. So I was like, oh, there you go. <laughs> Five feet by seven feet. It's almost worth taking a trip to DC just to check that one out. Um, or not check it out. Though I guess if yeah, yeah, here's what you do: you get your representative, write your congressperson, and ask them to check out the five foot by seven foot book <laughs> and just walk around uh, to see with it. I want to see that happen. Even better, um, run for uh, office yeah. and make that happen for yourself. Hey, people have people have been elected on on much thinner platforms yes, than have. that. So you know, much much less. Yes. Can yeah. I just say um, that the library has gone yeah. from having what? A few several thousand books to now 17 million books within its holdings. Yeah. That's just bananas to me. That's bananas. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, one other interesting thing is that the head of the Library of Congress is very rarely a librarian, which I think, yeah. you know, reflects a little bit of this conversation we're having about it being, but it's often a historian or a scholar. The current head does have some sort of on the ground library experience, mm-hmm. but generally speaking, um, it's, it's not. It's not that, and I'm sure that's a very controversial thing within the library community, but we don't have to wade into that. Um, okay. Let's end it there. Uh, Carrie Greenwich of Tufts University, thank you so much for doing this. This is really fun. Oh, thank you. This is fun, fun, fun. And be sure to check out the book, Black Radical, The Life and Times of William Monroe Trotter. And we will have you back at some point to actually talk about Trotter. Very fascinating figure. So let's find a hook for that for sure. Oh, yeah. I'll come back anytime. This is great. I love it. So thank you. Great. And uh, Nicole Hammer, thanks to you. Thank you, Jody. And Kelly Carter Jackson, thanks to you. My pleasure. This Day in Esoteric Political History is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, a network of independent, listener-supported, artist-owned podcasts. Our researcher and producer is Jacob Feldman. Our producer is Brittany Brown. Thanks again to everyone who has reached out with comments and questions and potential topics. You can email us, thisdaypod at gmail.com. My name is Jody Avergan. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you soon.